um, it didn't start out about straw bale. Right. It started out about co-housing. Uh -huh. uh, in 1994, I met a fellow, I can't think of his name now, he lived in the neighborhood where I was doing community development, and he was the head of the Ontario Co-Housing Coalition. And he, very soon after I met him, got moved out to Saskatoon because the city of Saskatoon is actually developing co-housing. Mm -hmm. So he went out there to work out there. Anyway, I, I got interested in co-housing because I was in my 30s. I was single. Um, there aren't too many white nights, uh, often for a woman like me. Um, so uh, I was very concerned about equity and renting and what was I going to do? I see too many women at age 60, they're still renting, and I think what happens when you cease to be employed, you know? And rents don't go down. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, they just keep going and <laughs> they go up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was concerned, so I started talking to a bunch of single women friends about co-housing. Grace had been looking at condos and stuff along the waterfront and everything, and I think she was finally kind of seeing the reality. I mean, she was, she's older than the two of us. She's, in her 50s now, so she's about six years older than me, I think. And uh, I think it was finally coming home to her, the reality of the equity situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, she did, a really, she did a pretty decent job at that point, but it was social work. It was, you know, 45, or 50, I think it was no more than 45 years. I don't think more than that, no. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, buying your own condo and everything, it's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know? And here I am turning 50 soon, and I don't have anything. So, um, yeah, somehow that all, and then we, were, we weren't so going to build. Sort of number one was economic in a way? For me it was for economics, you. for sure. And so then we were going to renovate, because I was very committed, because my work is urban, and I was very committed to staying in the city, and I lived in Hyde Park, and we were going to try to find a house in Hyde Park, and we didn't want to renovate. Well, we were a year or two too late for that, because, I mean, there's beautiful big old houses in Hyde Park. But that's just when the prices started to rise and everybody was renovating their houses and selling them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we'd walk into a newly renovated house and Beth would slowly sink to a floor. <laughs> yeah. Because of just all the off-gassing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because they would have just renovated and they would have put in so, all this new material. You know, a quarter and million dollars worth of renovation. Insulation. And we, we'd be standing there thinking, well, we'd have to rip that all out. That's right. You know, and then put in another half million worth of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So finally, the, the uh, agent, the real estate agent, said, you guys need to build your own house. And he sent us to five properties here in Mississauga one rainy Sunday evening. And we were all in tears at the thought of living in Mississauga. <laughs> I know Hazel wouldn't believe that, but we were. <laughs> and because um, it meant leaving the city and coming out to Mississauga. Mm. And uh, my two criteria were sh shopping within walking distance and transit. Mm. And in actuality, the transit's better here than where I lived in Hyde Park. And I can actually get more here within a mile, mile and a half walk than I could in yeah. And then right away started designing? Or? Actually, yeah. We, the day we closed, we had a picnic out here on the property. I mean, we hadn't even legally yeah. owned the property. You know, we carted out a picnic table on top of Martin's car and had, had a luncheon. <laughs> started designing on the site, because I was very committed to designing on the site. Yeah. You don't start designing from plans, you start designing on the site. And so we yeah. came out and started doing that. And That's we, Martin's preferred method too. Yes. He said, yeah, we go do that. So he said, so, hey, yeah, uh, sure. Well, we were all committed to Christopher Alexander. Right? And his name again was? Christopher Alexander. He's an architect who... Um, the timeless way of building. The pattern language is probably the most important one. Yeah. He, uh, he taught at Berkeley. He's retired now, uh, lives in England, but he taught at Berkeley in the 70s. He wrote that in the late 70s. And what he did is, he's a very, very brilliant man, um, graduated from Harvard and everything, but a very humble man in many ways. And uh, he spent a lot of time after his Harvard education um, observing what people really liked around their buildings and towns and all over the world. What were the common patterns? that people preferred. And then he put together the book. His comment on the book now is that it isn't that they so much missed patterns, but they missed um, giving people a sequence so that people could think through how to put things together. Mm -hmm. But that covers everything from how you would put together a town to how you would put together your house. And um, so we actually bought copies and, and kind of been through it, actually. 
Um, now it's interesting, most architecture schools would utterly disdain Christopher Alexander um, because uh, he's not a modernist, he's not, yeah. you know, he's not wedded to an aesthetic style, he's all the things that people like the architecture school where I went at U of T just hate, you know, they just can't stand him. He's, he's too people-oriented. He's too people-oriented, and he's too oh. humble. He's the only architect I've ever heard talk about God and talk about having to make a decision um, in, the, in context to the Creator. So he talks about, not in that book, but I've heard interviews with him, he talks about how if he's deciding how to build a pillar or a column, and he has to decide on the, on the base of the column, how wide it should be or what it should look like, and so the interviewer said, well, how do you make that decision? And I said, well, you know, if I can't make the decision, at some point I'll think to myself, which way will actually honor God more? And that's how he makes his decision. Hmm. Well, I mean, architects as a whole have no use for the creator, for God. You know, they, humility is not, not a word in their lexicon. So, you know, they just can't stand him. They just, they, he, his latest book, he did a series of books recently on the nature of beauty. And you're not even allowed to talk about that in architecture school, you know, I mean, everything's interesting, but nothing's ever beautiful. And he talks about, the typical architect, he's also into mathematics, and so he talks about kind of, over the ages, what are the characteristics of the things people find beautiful. And he did a lot of experiments, and he found that actually there are about 15 characteristics that people consistently find mm -hmm. are part of beautiful things, or pictures, or objects. And he found that over the years with the students, they always came back to the same 15 aspects or patterns or characteristics. So he's written a book about it. I haven't read it. But of course, that's the kind of thing that would go completely up the nose of the architecture profession, you know. So, wow. so we, we thought a lot, and I think one of the reasons um, some of the more successful aspects of this house are thinking through a lot of those patterns. I mean, all of us have bed spaces. We don't really have bed rooms. Um, you'll notice wow. my bed space, you know, it's just, it is a space for the bed, you know, and he talks about those kinds of things, alcoves for sleeping. Um, in my downstairs, you'll see there's windows on three sides of that room, and he talks about having windows always on two sides of the room because of how, how it makes the light work better. One of the first things I did when Martin first presented the plans for this house, he had a straight wall here with the window, and this used to make him crazy, I'm sure, because he faxed plans to me, and I didn't know anything, and this is before I went to architecture school, and I'd take the plans, and I'd white out what I didn't like, and he was wait working quarter-inch scale, then he was still working in Imperial, I don't know if he still does, but a lot of architects have switched to metric, but uh, he was working in Imperial, so I didn't have a scale, but I had a ruler, so I could figure out the quarter-inch scale, right, and I'd draw in the way I liked something, and I'd fax it back to him, <laughs> And then he'd fax it back to me with his stuff, and I'd white out all his lines again, draw it out, fax it back to him. Anyway, that went on for months. But and the, <laughs> like, the things like straw bale and solar panels and... We already knew we were going to do all that. It was straw bale from the get-go. Because yeah. we already had that was conversation it? with Brian. So. We had lunch one day with a friend who became the first construction manager, and he was into straw bale. They mentioned it to us. That was Brian, yeah, who was we work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that was something yeah. I knew about already as well. So. Yeah, so it just became an assumption that it would be mm -hmm. straw bale. And the solar was always an assumption. Yeah. Always. Well, but because yeah. partly because we were trying to do a healthy house, meaning yeah. not just right. a non-toxic chemical house, but also healthy in terms of how you interact with it and healthy in terms of how it interacts with the environment. So straw bale is a healthy way to... Partly to get really good insulation, which is good environmentally, and partly, of course, you know, to use up a waste material. Mm -hmm. We were so naive when we walked into it. We did not know a thing about Mississauga uh, and how it would well, <coughs> handle us. I have to say my housemates were more naive than I was. <laughs> Very much so. Because we was, but maybe was that important to be? Or like if well, you... we submitted the plans in August 98. I... And they said, well, six to eight weeks, so everybody sat back. And I kept saying, they're never going to approve this house. They're never going to approve this house. So eight weeks came and went, 
12 weeks came and went, 3 we four kept, months we, came and well, went. Well, we kept um, doing things, you know. We, I, Martin kept trying to give them information. Well, it, it was like six months into it when they all of a sudden called us out. Called, did they call Martin? Saying, they're strong in these plans. We're going, yeah, that's been there from the beginning, you know. Well, it took them six months to realize it was a custom house, for heaven's sakes. Yes. By that time, I mean, three months into it or four months into it, I said, you know, we should sell this property and go further out because we would have less problem. Mm -hmm. And so somehow I knew Mississauga was going to be a problem, but everybody else, including Martin, was like, oh, they'll get it, they'll get it, and we'll have no problems on going anywhere. No, so, I figured I, we, were, we were expecting some problems, just not as many as we got. Oh, it was amazing. Mississauga was never going to let us build this house if they had their way. It would never get built. And uh, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know what their problem is, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. I wrote Hazel a four-page, I wrote Hazel two letters last fall. And I said, you yeah, know, it's recent, you, not what we were building. Yeah, and I said, you know, you advertise yourself on your website as a green community. Mm -hmm. said, so here was our experience in building the house, and here's some other issues I have with all of that. And we got a four-page letter back from Hazel, which was so irrational. I read it out loud to Beth the day it came, and we couldn't believe it. It was totally irrational, very defensive. And the whole thing was, well, it was the province that held up the house. Well, of course, that wasn't true. Because there were 50 straw bale houses already in the province when mm -hmm. we came to build. So their contention was, well, they couldn't give approval because it wasn't in the building code. And yada, yada, yada. And we're like, well, no, actually, well, those are rural rubes and they don't know anything. And, you know, they're just <laughs> like, they're so dumb out there. And, you know, yeah, that was their whole attitude, really. Yes. Completely. It really was, yes. So, um, you know, then we ended up. So by spring 99, they were willing to finally issue a permit without straw. So they would issue a permit for a regular house. So we started building in May of 99. And what happened was then, you know, I mean, there was a lot to do before we got the straw, obviously, so they just started building. Eventually, of course, what it meant was they ended up uh, enclosing the second floor before the first floor got enclosed, which was kind of weird. It made it look like some sort of strange pavilion and valley. But, um, you know, some sort of strange picnic pavilion, but, yeah. um, <laughs> The huge picnic pavilion, yeah, yes. It was very strange, but, um, anyway, so then in the fall of 99, uh, we went to the, we had the two hearings at the Ontario Building Code Commission, which was record-breaking and, you know, unbelievable for them. In fact, the second hearing, because they'd never done two hearings on something before, and they rarely get owners in. It's usually guys coming in to get approvals for, you know, construction materials or something. And so it was very strange to have owners present at the table. Beth could only come to the table for so long before the room would poison Oh, it's so such a poisonous building. She'd leave. And well, it's your standard office I building. I last doing, about an hour. I ended up doing the preacher thing because I've been a preacher and a pastor and a minister. So I, I, I would close the meeting with this impassioned appeal of, you know, where are people like her supposed to live if we're not allowed to build healthy houses? So anyway, the second hearing, they had us in this huge boardroom, and they had everybody there. The head of the Building Code Commission was there. I mean, everybody was anybody was present. You know, there was like 40 people watching this hearing, you know. The scary thing was we found out that we, the owners, understood the physics of the building better than the engineers who were heading up the Building Code Commission Tribunal. You know, it was really scary. Because they just didn't understand the basics, you know, the walls, because they're breathing walls, right? Mm -hmm. And they did not understand the basics of how moisture moves through the walls and how air moves through the walls. And, well, you and see, they, they, just didn't get they, were, they had been taught, of course, that you shouldn't have anything moving through the walls, and you wanted to fight that as much as possible when they were going to yeah. school. So when we came along and started reading about a breathing wall, we went, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And they look at it and go, you're kidding. What? Huh? Our, our domestic hot water also gets heated on the roof. So that there's a solar hot water heater? As well as, yeah, as well as the solar uh, electric. So the gas is a backup, right? Yeah. Oh, so, it, so it, it, it's all on the same circuit or whatever, solar hot water. In and the winter, of course, it would be mostly. More gas, yeah, and then but then there's also like sort of passive solar coming in. There's it? passive solar, of course, because of all the mass. But there's also we do produce our own electrical energy on the roof on that end, right? We have yeah. the um, unisolar strips. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a little third trouble right here. A third of your electrical. I've realized 
how difficult it is to communicate spatial realities to the average person. First of all, I, I mean, in a lot of countries, people build their own space all the time and would think nothing of it. And if they didn't build their own cottage, they would at least be renoing it or expanding it. But they do it with their own hands. And so there's, I think, an intrinsic understanding of spatial reality and spatial design. Not that they would use that kind of language, but it's kind of intuitive. But in our culture, we're very separated from it. I mean, people go and buy, they think that's a custom house. You know, those are custom executive houses. And, and so they slap down their half million and, you know, okay, they get to pick what color corian they have on their counters. And, and, you know, do you want your bathroom on the left side or the right side? And who really cares anyway? But people have no real sense of materials because all they get is drywall. And they have very little sense of space. They haven't a clue what it means to design space. And I think people are also very disconnected about how they live in space. And if you're going to build something and design something, you have to be very, very clear, if you want it to be useful to you anyway, about how you live in the space, how you use space, what kind of space works best for you. And I think that is not something people know, because what people do in our culture is they buy a house they like, maybe it's because it's pseudo-Tudor, or it's a mock French chateau, and they fall in love with that, and, well, it's okay, you know, it's got five bathrooms, and that's what we want, and it's got this, and it's got that, and that's what we need, and it's got the sunroom, and the morning room, and the breakfast room, and yeah, dear, that's the house I'd love to have. And, but it's not because it necessarily works for them, they adjust themselves to the space. But when you actually have to design your own space, you have to think, well, how do I adjust the space to me? Which means you have to get really, really clear about some things, things that we aren't very clear about in our culture. And that's true whether it's straw bale or anything else.